Hi, my friends. How are you? I hope everybody is fine. My name is Daniel Villarino. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In the next videos, I will continue with the issue of the spheres, and there are a couple of methods that I would like to show you. One is known several times with the method of the three axes, or also has the method of the three rotations. Uh, the other one, uh, I don't think it has a name, and I begin to call it the method of the revolution, and we will see why. I have seen a few videos. I remember Alan Stratton, Frank Horward, and also Mike Pease, and they do this method of the three axes. And at the beginning, I wasn't really clear about the process itself. So I, I tried to make the, the diagrams that we are going to watch next to clarify a little bit this process on the theoretical side. That way, when you see the next videos, the practical ones, you're going to be able to understand much better the process, and also I will be able to explain it much better. So this is today's video. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to work. In good terming, we are pretty familiar with the concept of rotating a piece of wood around an axis. When we apply a tool to it and we shape the wood, what we are creating is a solid of revolution. There are many solids of revolutions that are familiar to us. Rotating a rectangle with respect to its sides, we obtain a cylinder. And in good terming, we are all the time making cylinders. Rotating a right triangle with respect to one of its legs, we will get a cone, and that is another solid of revolution to which we are familiar. A first view, it may not seem like it, but every vessel, pot, plate, bowl, pen, bottle stopper, etc., that we make in the lathe is as well a solid of revolution. One of the most spectacular solids of revolution is obtained when we rotate a half a circle with respect to the diameter. Yes, it is a sphere, and the amazing thing is that no matter what diameter of the circle we use as axis, when we complete a revolution, we obtain always the same sphere. Let's take this circle and trace a line through its center. Let's rotate it with respect to this axis, and in the next images we will be seeing that, when performing this revolution, a sphere is forming. Since the circle is symmetrical with respect to its diameter, the sphere will be forming both from above and from below. Finally, we get a complete sphere. To turn a sphere through the process of the three axes, we want this axis to form a three-dimensional Cartesian coordinate system. Before we go to the theoretical process of how to do this turning, I would like to imagine the sphere is already done and see how it interacts with these three axes. Here you can see that they have marked an axis in yellow, another axis in blue, and the final axis in red. I will perform a revolution of the sphere with respect to the yellow axis. If, when doing so, we apply a yellow pencil to the widest part of the sphere, we will draw on it a circumference that will have the same diameter as the sphere. Now, we will make a rotation of the sphere and the axis but only of 90 degrees with respect to the red axis. So now the yellow axis is pointing upwards. If we now make a revolution of the sphere along its blue axis and we repeat the procedure, but this time with a blue pencil, we will get another circumference that will be 90 degrees respect to the first one. Once again, let's make another 90 degree twist. But this time with respect to the yellow axis, so the blue will be pointing forward and the sphere will rotate on the red. If we now make a revolution with respect to the red axis, 
and we repeat the process, we will get a third circumference marked in red pencil that will be 90 degrees with respect to the first two. By doing this procedure, we have separated the sphere in identical sectors, A to be exact. I know that at this point, we may be a little dizzy with so many rotations and revolutions, but the idea is that with each different position of the axis, we are exposing to the tool different zones of the sphere, and if we apply this to the good plan, we have a big probability of ending up with a perfect sphere. Let's see this in a diagram, but like if we were departing from a square good plan. Here you can see the blank place between centers. On one side, in darker gray, we have the spur center. And on the other face, in a lighter gray, we have the light center. We start the lathe and we turn a cylinder with a diameter identical to the sphere we want to obtain. This beginning is an approximation. And to demonstrate that in reality, the only important thing is the central part in the diagram, I am showing a lot of irregularities. What we have to shape with a more or less spherical shape is the central part. We will remark the pencil line. In this image, we see the result of our operations with the central line that will be of great reference at the start of this process. Let's separate the sport and life center and replace them with the cup centers. Now we will rotate the piece 90 degrees in such a way that the black circumference that we had traced before is now trapped between the cup centers. Perhaps now it will be easier to understand why the important sector was the central one surrounding the black line, since that sector will have to sit the best way possible between the cup centers. The rest Really, we can approximate it the best way we can. But if it has small knobs, like the ones left by the spur and life center, or if it is not that perfect, it is not really too relevant. With the piece held this way, we will turn the lathe on and begin to eliminate the irregularities. What it is in excess is marked in grey in this image. The important concept here is that while we eliminate these irregularities, we have to try to maintain, as best as we can, the black reference line. Ideally, we should arrive to a situation like this one, where we have removed all the excess wood and we still keep the black reference mark. Now, when we turn off the lathe, the black line could be at the position shown in this figure. If we look this from above, we see that the black band is parting the sphere by the middle. The most probable is that we kept the black band, but it was in another position. In that case, do not worry too much. It is only a question of rotating the lathe by hand, so that the black band will be in the position we mentioned before, so that looking from above, we see it parting the sphere into equal parts. In other words, like the position in the further left. What would happen if we kept the black band by this place, like in this figure, forming an horizontal plane with respect to the lathe bed? The problem is that now we have to make another one, this one in blue, that will cut the black one in half. And after that, we will reposition the sphere between the cup centers by rotating it 90 degrees like in the figure. When we do this, the result is that we came back to having the black reference band running through the widest part, like in the beginning, and that is not the result we are seeking. Another thing that may have happened was that we did not maintain the original black band. Like in this figure, we have erased it almost completely and we can just see some remands very close to the cup center. If this is what happened, it means that we have reduced the diameter too much. We will have to trace a new black band and begin from scratch from that point to obtain a sphere which diameter will be slightly below the diameter of the original cylinder. Do not worry, this happens a lot with this method, more often than not. 
it is just a question of persevering and being a bit more careful this time. If not, we will keep reducing and reducing the final diameter of the sphere. But let's turn to the point where everything was going well. We were able to keep the black line and now we trace the blue. With the black line in its position towards the top, we perform a 90 degree rotation like the one shown in the diagram. The result of this rotation is that now the parts that were covered by the cup centers are exposed and will point one to the top and the other to the bottom. If we turn on the lathe and begin to apply the tool very slightly and trying to maintain now both the blue and black lines, we will get our sphere. If we were to apply now a yellow pencil, for example, we would achieve the division of the sphere in eight identical sectors like we saw before. For the sanding, we will repeat the process of the 90 degree twists for each grid. So, we will rotate for the three axes for 80 grid if there is where we want to start. All the time will be convenient to trace reference lines for the sanding, and that is something we will see better in the practical video. The important point in this video was to try to understand the mechanism of the rotations since watching it in some other videos it was not really too clear to me. Making these diagrams and seeing it from a more theoretical point of view I believe it will be much easier for me to explain it in the practical video and in any case you can always come back to this video to refresh the theory. Ok my friends, I know that the video was a little theoretical but I think it's going to help in the next videos that I'm going to make. I wanted uh, to let you know that the next one is going to be about an enhancement to the cap centers. I will make some marks that will allow us to align better the sphere when we are pressing it between the, these cap centers. Also, I'm going to make a video about the three axis method and I wanted to let you know that I will be modifying a little bit the end of my videos now to accommodate it better to the new YouTube formats. I'm going to place over there some information about videos that you may be interested, suggested by me or suggested by YouTube, and also the button for subscribing so that you just have to click it and you get subscribed immediately to the channel. So, that's all for the moment. I hope you enjoyed the video. If that's the case, don't forget to mark the like button below and also to make comments. And it will be until the next one. Cheers!